We've tried nothing and we're all out of ideas. <laughs> go it's wednesday may the 18th welcome into the rit race it is the daily version of the on the ledge podcast the ontario politics podcast and uh later this evening i'm going to be out in uh, scarborough moderating a, a town hall discussion with candidates from four parties not five the green party will be there the new blue party will be there the ndp the liberals there the Tories have made it abundantly clear they do not wish to show their face in any one of these gatherings. And you can take that as you will. Uh, but I, we started off with the clip from Simpsons. We've tried nothing and, you know, we've run out of ideas. That's kind of where I think this conversation is going to go tonight in Scarborough. There are all kinds of people who live in poverty, legislated poverty, in those six ridings. There are all kinds of people who have suffered extraordinarily prior to the pandemic. The pandemic only made it worse. So at the heart of the conversation will be, you know, housing and health care. I love that unvarnished campaign that the Scarborough hospitals have done. Yeah. Hello, we're over here. So if you want to join us, go to the um, Scarborough Community Renewal Organization is the group that's running this thing, scro.ca, and you can register to join in person or uh, otherwise it'll be uh, streamed on the interweb. They got the YouTube channel up, so we'll join you there and we'll include some of that information tomorrow just to give you a sense of what was going on in the daily edition of On the ledge, it's the Rit Race. Today, Sabrina Nanji is here from Queen's Park Observer, John Wright from Maru Public Opinion. And uh, one of the things we talked about yesterday, I have to correct, we said that um, 16% of adults in Scarborough live on ODSP or Ontario Welfare. The folks in Scarborough uh, realized that they had sent along a typo. It was 10.6% living on assistance as opposed to 16%. Now, Sabrina, you know, 16% is an awful number, and it's no better to say, well, it's only 10.6%. That's one in 10 working adults who require those benefits. It comes to about, the estimate around 60,000 people require that to get through the month. That's a small city. Yeah, absolutely. I think that number is is still pretty um, staggering for a lot of people. Uh, And of course, we're in the middle of a campaign. So uh, we're kind of talking about it a little bit more. You know, Uh, I I think the the conservatives uh, were kind of forced to move on this issue. They had unbudgeted uh, a 5% increase to ODSP rates. I think, you know, the rate is about uh, just over $1,100 a month for a single person. We know in Toronto, in Scarborough, in virtually anywhere in this province, you know, you can't live off of that. Uh, so, so I get it when advocates are calling this legislated poverty. Uh, you know, the Ford was was questioned on this. Uh, of course, you know, he, he still technically got the premier's seat. He's the, he's the man in charge. He's the man leading the polls. And he had stuck to his line up until, you know, the 11th hour when uh, his, his old adage that the best way to help folks on disability is to get them a job. And of course, you know, a lot of people can't work. And that's kind of the whole point of this of this benefit system. Uh, and then we saw, you know, the other parties move on it. Uh, the Liberals are promising a 20 percent increase to ODSP rates over two years. Advocates say that's still not enough and it's not quick enough. Uh, the NDP was also forced to move on this. Essentially, they were promising a 20 percent increase immediately, uh, a little quicker than the Liberals. But the Greens have kind of led the pack on this. Uh, I know we're we're kind of coming out as green fans on this on this podcast a little bit, uh, even though they've got no shot at, at forming government. 
this time around, they are uh, doing a good job at, at forcing the other party's hands. So now the NDP is also promising to double the ODSP rates like the Greens are doing. Uh, the Greens will do it uh, quicker. But like I said, you know, uh, I guess maybe that's Mike Schreiner's effectiveness here is that he's uh, he's pushing, you know, the, the pro- so-called progressive parties to be maybe more progressive on this front. Uh, I think it's also interesting that uh, the parties want to bring back the basic income pilot, which would help a lot of, uh, you know, people in, in these situations. Uh, you know, it initially started out as a pilot where, uh, you'd get a certain amount. I believe it was just over $16,000. I would have to go back to my notes to, to fact check myself on that one. And it was in only certain communities, but essentially you wouldn't start getting your benefits clawed back. And, uh, if you were working an, until, uh, 50% of what you were making. So, you know, the conservatives initially said they wouldn't cancel that pilot. It was a liberal era project. They came into power, they canceled it. And that was really disappointing for a lot of people, including, you know, people in the the conservatives own camp, like something like a guaranteed annual income was, uh, you know, touted by Ronald Reagan south of the border. I know so-called red Tories like Hugh Siegel have been huge proponents of it here. And so obviously, you know, these folks would be putting money back into the economy. Uh, You know, conservatives have a, a stereotype, I guess, small C conservatives of not being so compassionate. But there's also economic benefits here. And I think this is, you know, the election, there's a lot of talk, there's a lot of rhetoric, but this might be an opportunity, especially as we're coming out of the pandemic, everyone can kind of commiserate with uh, low wages and that sort of struggle. I think, you know, this is an opportunity to, to really, you know, push the parties on it. So here's the interesting thing to me on this file, and I didn't necessarily mean to, to take us down this path, but I'm glad we've gone here because you know what? For the first time, John, the other night in the in the debate, I have been throwing this number out for three years now, and this is a pre-pandemic number. It costs Ontario $33 billion a year to service the cost of poverty. Every year. That's every year. We could build three crosstown lines for that. It's crazy. Mike Schreiner finally cited the number the other night. So to Sabrina's point, Mike Schreiner's not going to be the premier of Ontario anytime soon. He may he may be, as you like to say, become the leader of the NDP, and that might be where he fits and might have a better shot at it. But to his credit, I think we uh, we we oversimplify things in dismissing that because he is putting things out in front of Ontarians. He's brave enough to put things on the table that need to be talked about. Yeah, but the so with full disclosure, I have two Gen Zs and two Gen Xs, and the Gen Zs are very different uh, compared to the Gen X group. The Gen X group came in at a time when you know, or the millennials were moving along and they're kind of glutted. They're a little bit like the baby boomers back when we were coming out of high school. I mean, there was lots of them and elbows up trying to get jobs. And I even had one daughter who did a university degree in media and then uh, journalism was one of those kids who actually went out and voiced baseball games because she loved media, who uh, then did a college course at Seneca on top of a degree, did an internship at a television stadium uh, station. And as, at the end of the internship, the digital uh, news media took over and everybody got fired, let go. She couldn't find a job. So Sounds she's, uh, familiar. Yeah. So <laughs> but there was a whole generation there who had trouble sure. getting jobs and ended up, you know, eventually in kind of hourly wages. Whereas The next set of kids are in such high demand. I mean, they can basically write their ticket for whatever they want. And what I I noticed about that uh, is that they're very, both of them, uh, the Gen uh, Xers, the millennials, they're very hardworking people, but they just haven't been able to get that step into the next rung. They weren't kind of lawyers or doctors. They weren't, there's no one representing them in this campaign. There's not a single party who has targeted this group, and we've talked about this before, the 18 to 34-year-old group, who is without the hope of a house, earning lower wages, crushed under um, um, loans that they took for school. I mean, you hear about upper white, you know, upper class folks who are lawyers who would retort and say, well, I had, you know, school loans and I was able to pay them back. We're talking about $23 an hour with no benefits and having, you know, 16 to $18,000 of crushing debt to them. 
and there's and there's nobody sticking up for them in this election campaign. And I well, find but, it, hold on, let me just stop you there because I think what Sabrina just said, and I think every party, with the exception of the Tories, is talking about this discussion around basic or guaranteed income. I think that gets right at the heart of what it, you're talking about. Yes, it 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 does, and we're not t- talking at cross purposes here. The answer is yes. Um, it, there's need to be uh, some kind of of approach that that helps solve this, as there has been for many years. And you're right, Sabrina, Hugh Siegel had a pilot going on in in Ontario, and it was Dean French in that first year of the Conservative government that just slapped it to the curb, shut it down before we even had a chance to see what it looks like. And I don't know when we ever will there. But to the greater sense of the campaign, that group, that disaffected, that divided uh, group, uh, and they're not young people anymore. I mean, they're in their 30s now. There's no constituency that is targeted to harness them to go out and vote even though yeah, they're the, I, it, I, I just that, it's that, so that, frustrating that that group can't get a break that that lead and the first you know age of the, the at the edge of the millennials they they're they're going to be 40 this year so <laughs> well I mean, we're, they're not kids in somebody's basement necessarily this these are people who have had to struggle with and make adult decisions about work about home about family about kids about schools they're living that. I mean, you and I are well past that in many respects. You know, we're, we're not talking about trying to find daycare. We're not trying to find about you know all of those real life big decisions. And so, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think we, especially in the media, we have this view. You know, we forget that people are getting to that age now. And, Holy cow, they're getting close to middle age, the millennials. Well, and they're going to have to wait until someone like me decides to sell the house. And then I can transfer some wealth to them so that they can, you know, buy a house themselves. I, I, I do, in a kind of dark humor, say that if you wait until 2036 to 2041, there's going to be a huge glut of houses on the marketplace because all those seniors will have gone. I'm not going to be around doing, you know, what Excellent. I'm doing today, but they're going to be in their 50s before they benefit from this at least. So yeah. all I'm saying is that this is a discussion point that is around affordability. It's around the gas prices. It's around the inflation. It's around grocery stores. It's around everything. Like, I just don't understand how you can't means test student debt. That after five years, if, you, if you're if you earning $23 an hour and there's no hope of paying it back, just blow it off. This is the progressive part that every party, and especially Doug Ford's, could be embracing right now. Um, and and nobody's calling out for that voice. So it's it's been a disappointment in some ways as a father who sees this happening to 30-year-old kids, but it's also a hole that is missing or a hole in this campaign rhetoric that just doesn't seem to be addressed. It's, it's over yeah. the top, even by the natural constituents that you would think, and that would be, you know, the, the liberals and the NDP. It's just not there. I want to get to your most recent research, and I want to get to the uh, the latest uh, endorsement for the Tories. But just to pick up on this thread for a second, um, Sabrina, when we talk about the effect of CERB, for example, I think a lot of people looked at that and said, you know, there's a kind of a model for basic or guaranteed income. It made a difference. It was positive. I discovered last night, I was reading up on this because I'm going to the Scarborough event tonight. For those people who actually received it, you would think, wow, the 2000 bucks was going to make be great, except it meant that they ended up paying more for rent. And the reason they paid more for rent is because their rent is based is driven by their income, is based on income. So it was a certain percentage of your income, no matter how much you were making. So if you were only making $1,169 a month, it was 30% of that. If all of a sudden you're making 2000 it's 30% of that. So that wasn't really taken into the equation. And I think it's, you know, it's one of those things where we're going to have to, to John's point, sort of look at how we um, either qualify people for this or what applies to the basic necessities and what it's going to pay for. Because we can bring the guaranteed income in. And if people are still starving because they can't, you know, afford rent and it artificially drives up the cost of the rent, it doesn't make any sense. That's way down in the weeds, but that's where people are living and they're hurting. Yeah, I think that was kind of, you know, the main takeaway and what we're hearing ODSP uh, advocates saying now, uh, you know, that uh, 
uh, we, we've seen SERP come in at $2,000. So clearly, you know, at least the feds think that that's the baseline to be able to survive on. But it, as you said, everything is connected, right? And I just remember uh, back in the Mike Harris and Ernie Eves days, uh, Minister uh, Tabucci, uh, you know, when they were making cuts to social assistance rates, then, you know, there was this kind of mini scandal because he, he came up with this uh, faux grocery list to kind of lay out the costs of what we the would well, the welfare what we would need. Yeah, the welfare diet. right. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, you know, like it was like, OK, you can get, you know, a can of tomatoes cheaper because it's dented, things like that. I mean, anyone who goes, obviously, you know, this is years ago, but anyone who's going to the grocery store today, like maybe we could have some more meaningful policy design here instead of, yeah, just throwing around numbers. You know, uh, advocates are already saying 20 percent isn't enough. Of course, 5 percent won't cut it from the conservatives uh, and doubling it. Obviously, you know, that's going to have an impact on uh, the, the province's books, too. And, and as you said, everything is connected. So I think, you know, maybe we need another Hugh Siegel type uh, to get some evidence based decision making. I hate to use that. That I mean, check that one off mm-hmm. on your bingo card, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, again, it's it's low hanging fruit. Um, the Statistics Canada has just released as we are doing this podcast that inflation is now 6.8%, which is up from 6.7% last uh, last month. Um, but food is up significantly in that bracket. And we have to also suggest that those people who are running the food stores, the big cheeses at the top, are making a lot more money than they were. And that's evidence, you know, when we're in reports. But gas prices are up 40%, 40%. And if you are driving to an hourly job, now, in my, again, my, my older son has a job in the construction industry, was a chef and then got into the construction industry and has to drive out of town to get that hourly wage. Spending now a week $700 in gas, $700 in gas, which was not even close to it before. And now, of course, the employers are balking at paying the, the price. This is a serious issue that demands serious discussion, but there doesn't seem to be anybody addressing this. And I would argue that Doug Ford is probably in the best position to do so because of the union households that have supported him, close to 40 percent of them across the province. Those are the ones who are earning that <clears throat> that middle wage or lower, um, the Doug Ford government that wants to make sure that those young people who are into the uh, health care system that they've been trying to recruit um, to, you know, go to school and graduate, well, they're, they're all going to be low-end jobs. And if the government looks like it's going to have a majority for the next number of years, it might as well have those people on board. So, yes, I kind of am looking at this from a self-centered point of view because it's in my family. But the reality is that we have talked about this before on our podcast, going back to probably two years ago, where we saw this cohort of 18 to 34 year olds who were just slipping further and further and further below the radar screen of politicians who are hurting every single day because there's no voice. And that is a natural constituency that the liberals and the NDP could be speaking to. But frankly, I don't, as I said, this is. The term affordability kind of washes all over that, doesn't it? Like it just, it's not, they don't have a champion. And I noticed this as well during the federal election campaign. So I don't know what it does, except it provides for a very cynical class of people who say, why am I even voting? What's the point? And also they're, you know, driven further and further into debt and to in in opportunity because they just don't have the means to, to get out of that hole. It's just, it's a shame we're in an election campaign and those people are hurting the most and there's nobody standing up for them at all. So yesterday we sort of all agreed by consensus that there were no real fireworks in the debate, that it was pretty much what we would have expected and, you know, uh, and moved on. It wasn't until we closed out yesterday that I was flipping through social media and saw video of the demonstration that went outside, went on outside TVO. And there's what purported to be uh, a nurse who was uh, wrestled to the ground by police, apparently injured, uh, attended to by another nurse on the scene, but even at that was given a rough time by the police in terms of offering help. And it kind of is the backdrop 
of the discussion that was going on inside Sabrina, where, you know, have you have you talked to a nurse lately? Was Mike Schreiner's line to, to, to Doug Ford? Um, and then you take John Wright's research today, and all the healthcare workers are at the top of the list in terms of those whom we respect most. It's a it's a small thing, but you got to wonder two things. It surprised me a little bit that I had to find this floating through social media a day later, as opposed to it kind of popping to the surface in the news coverage of the event. And now I realize that most people were kind of looking at it virtually, and very few people inside, et cetera. But that still happened in broad daylight. Yeah, uh, my understanding um, from my vantage point, which wasn't very, very good, I'll admit uh, there was a lot of people and and crowds there. uh, It was that I thought it was uh, Ford security, actually, but uh, I'll have to get a better look and and double check that um, that that had, you know, tussled with this nurse. Uh, Yeah, things are getting pretty rowdy there. Uh, You know, the the nurses were there, uh, you know, uh, fighting against Bill 124, that wage capping legislation. Uh, Doug Ford had a lot of security with him as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I did see some news reports mention that, uh, that that happened. You know, the person, uh, the, the, the nurse was okay. Uh, yeah, they were, they were taken in an ambulance, but, you know, no um, sustained injuries, I guess, is the, is the phrasing of it. Uh, but, you know, t- tensions are running high. And I think to, you know, the, the point Shriner was trying to make there it, and what I've been hearing from nurses, you know, on the front lines and also the unions, the associations that are represented them is that they're kind of tired right now of empty words. Bill 124 remains a huge sticking point for unions. Of course, you know, that caps uh, wage annual wage increases for public sector workers at 1% for three years. Uh, and, you know, as John just mentioned, like, look at inflation and, and how that skyrocketed. So I think, uh, you know, the Ford government hasn't budged on that one, uh, but it still remains a very contentious point uh, with the unions in particular who have challenged this bill in, in, in the courts, you know, saying that this infringes on their rights to collectively bargain in freely. Uh, but this is going to be a, a spot that, you know, is a weak spot for Ford. He kind of seemed to just gloss over it, of course, during the debate, give us some talking points about these healthcare heroes. But it's like, sure, maybe, you know, the the pot banging at 7 p.m. that we used to do at the height of the pandemic, you know, was symbolic. But I think especially now, especially as things are, you know, better, of course, uh, I think we've seen hospitalizations tick up a little bit now. But, you know, our healthcare workers are burnt out too. There's a huge surgery backlog. Uh, you know, the liberals have promised $1 billion to help clear that, but it, we have to look at the staffing side of this too. It's not just about beds. It's not just about, uh, you know, wages even, uh, you know, nurses are getting a $5,000 retention bonus. I think for a lot of nurses that I'm speaking with, it's, it's frankly insulting to them uh, to hear, you know, politicians call them heroes and then not actually do enough on the policy side to deal with, you know, the next stage of this pandemic. Pandemic, which is going to be dealing with that backlog, dealing with physician, nursing, burnout. Uh, and this is going to be like a, the next big uh, problem that, that our healthcare sector is going to be dealing with. Well, the problem here, though, I think initially is it's great to say we're going to put a billion dollars into it. And we're going to hire this number of thousands of healthcare workers. But, John, where do these people come from? Because right now we don't have capacity. We have um, education programs that are four years long. When my wife went to nursing school, it was two years of nursing and then you you worked on the ward. That's where you learned. Why are I mean, there's nobody talking about that. This is us. We need to shift that focus, make it. We need to cut the red tape <laughs> and to actually deal with this capacity <clears throat> issue. Well, Dave, you hit the nail on the head. And it's something that has been talked about by there's a great book called The Empty Planet by John uh, um, Ibbotson and Daryl Bricker, my former colleague, um, and, and talks about the shrinking nature of of people. Um, the 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 demographics, not the people themselves, but the demographics. <laughs> smaller, <laughs> smaller uh, Ant Man. Um, and, and and here's the long and the short of it: as economies grow, uh, there's less reliance on having more kids. And if you look worldwide, uh, the debate has changed from, you know, we need less people in the world uh, because we we don't have enough mouths to feed uh, to where economies grow. And then you have, instead of 10 kids, you have eight kids, and then you have six kids, and then you have three kids, and then you have no kids. So what we have is a worldwide shortage of people. That's the first thing. Secondly, in this country, it's incredibly acute. 
where you not only have less people being born, we're, we're below the replacement stage. And you're going to have to, by the year 2041, have immigrants replacing 100% of our population. But before we get there, you have people like me who are going to say, I've had enough of this. See you later. In a couple of years, I'm going to retire. And that takes people out of the workforce. So what do we get? We get the Royal Bank the other day committing $200 million to strengthen the bottom four tiers of their employment rank, keep people in the jobs that they have, like right on the front lines. And you sort of say, well, that's because of the great resignation of the, uh, of the, the pandemic. The answer is no. We're just running out of people. So when you hear, you know, the NDP and the Liberals stand up and say, we're going to hire 10,000 of this and 10,000 of that, and we're going to do this or that. Yeah, really? Like, yeah, you're going to not only have to put them to school, but you're also going to have to recruit them from the Philippines or from other places or maybe the Ukraine to come into your system and be able to do that. But secondly, you're going to have to invest in that now which takes me full circle to what I just said a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're you're taking people now who are coming to this country. They will be immigrants, the majority of them who will enter that that level, and you're going to have to make an investment in them to to rent a place, not own a place, but rent a place. Well, you try to do that anywhere in downtown Toronto, and there's no way they can afford that. So government itself has a responsibility in the very short term to try and rectify that Otherwise, there's going to be no services for long-term care. I mean, we hear about long-term care, but, you know, we, we aren't going to have the people to go and help people in long-term care. So, yeah, we have a bit of a crisis coming. But it's demographically predictable. Go go to the Stats Canada site and look under demography. We have this rise until 236. We're, we're at the zenith then of our healthcare system being burdened. And then there's a fall off stage to 241, 2041. And then after that, pretty much free sailing, a very different society. But between now and 241, 2041, we're in a big pickle. And we won't have enough people to fill these jobs. And we're going to have a, a healthcare system that's overburdened. So that debate will only happen probably in not only the next election, but the election after that, which will be too late. And that it mm. needs to be talked about now. Yes, it does need to be talked about. So uh, maybe we'll pick that up tomorrow. Let's leave it there. Thank you, John Wright from Aru Public Opinion and Sabrina Nanji from the Queen's Park Observer. I'm Dave Trafford. This is the Rit Race. It is the daily edition of On the Ledge, the Ontario Politics Podcast. Just a reminder, we will be at the uh, Scarborough Community Renewal Organization event tonight, and we will be setting you up with all of the issues that face Scarborough, so you can join us. Go to scro.ca, register for the event. You can watch it, the live stream, on YouTube. That'll do it for us. I'm Dave Trafford. It is the Rit Race, the daily edition of On the Ledge, the Ontario Politics Podcast for Story Studio Network.